26 km of altitude, 3300 km per hour of speed, a surface heated to hundreds of degrees and an exterior of a starship. At the sight of these forms, everyone will say that we are talking about the SR-71, but the story is so big that it is divided into several complementary parts, telling about it and its brothers. Yes, the Great and Terrible Blackbird was not just not the only aircraft, it was one of the models and the fourth one at that. The heroes of our story can be considered one of the symbols of progress, monuments to the era of speed and a shining example of what the human mind is capable of. Welcome to the Age of the Archangels. Like many breakthrough stories, this story began with a problem. In the mid-1950s, Lockheed raced into the sky their high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft, the U-2. The Dragon Lady was a unique machine that combined simplicity and capabilities, primarily the high-altitude flights of about 21 kilometers or 70,000 feet. The Air Force and the CIA quickly found a use for it, sending it on many intelligence missions, primarily to the Soviet Union. The beginning of the flights, like any big exam, revealed all the pros and cons. The flight altitude justified itself. It was almost impossible to get to the U-2 at its altitude. On the other hand, it was impossible to shoot it down, but it turned out to be easy to detect by radars. The priceless dot appeared on the screens and shone brightly. And the third problem, the pace of development of air defense missile systems, made the U-2's impunity a very temporary bonus. Even then, at the end of the 1950s, the aviation industry and intelligence wondered how they would work when height alone was not enough. There were several potential paths. The first was to abandon the aircraft in principle and give reconnaissance functions to satellites. Despite the seeming obviousness of this option, in practice it was very problematic. The first satellites could not provide data of required quality, and even if they could, not everywhere a satellite could replace an aircraft. So if the space can become a universal remedy, it won't be soon. The second option was to find some ways to make the planes even more elusive. Back in 1956, the Rainbow Project was deployed, the task of which was to study the possibility of reducing the radar signature of the U-2. In fact, an attempt to turn it into stealth. The Rainbow Project brought a decent amount of developments, but did not become a breakthrough. Stealth was recognized as promising, but at that time, something else was needed. In 1957, it was decided to start a completely new large-scale work. To determine the vector of research, an interdepartmental committee was formed, which was named Project Gusto. In the opinion of the committee, the combination of high altitude, speed, a special shape of the airframe and the introduction of radio-absorbing materials would complicate the work of radars and make the aircraft unreachable to air defense systems. Interestingly, a special emphasis was placed precisely on speed. The idea was that an object flying at high speed would still be visible, but due to the so-called blip-to-scan ratio effect of the radar display, the data would be ragged, the dot would jump on the screen. Adding altitude and stealth to this could lead to the fact that a plane would be difficult to detect and identify, and by the time this was done, it would simply leave. The problem was that the minimum speed had to exceed Mach 3, more than 3000 km per hour, and it must not be some kind of prototype record holder, but a full-fledged reconnaissance aircraft flying at such a speed in cruising mode. The CIA got inspired, but they needed resources. Despite the fact that the future aircraft was perceived as the successor of the U-2, Dragon Lady was a rather simple and cheap project, and what was offered now was comparable in complexity perhaps to space programs. The main bidders of the tender were Convair and Lockheed. Convair, which just recently launched the B-58 Hustler supersonic bomber, proposed creating a small, high-speed reconnaissance aircraft, which would be delivered to the mission area on the suspension of an upgraded Super Hustler aircraft. Lockheed led the project of a high-speed reconnaissance plane, first called U-3 and then Archangel, a kind of new level of the Angel project, as the U-2 was sometimes called. At the initial stage, their plane resembled a large starfighter. The idea of taking the F-104 as the basis did not let go. The competition was tough. 
After it became clear that the Super Hustler would not be made, Convair offered their Kingfish reconnaissance aircraft. Lockheed in turn came up with the Archangel A-11, which, yes, was the 11th official iteration of their concept. According to various estimates, the Convair plane, with its angular shapes and engines recessed under the airframe, was less visible on radars, while the A-11 was superior in flight performance. Skunk Works, deciding to improve stealth, made another modification. Well, not really a modification. The concept was again remade from scratch, but everyone got used to it already. So finally, the 12th version of the Archangel was born. In 1960, the CIA selected the Lockheed Project and ordered 12 A-12 aircraft. Project Gusto on the search of a suitable plane was completed, and in its place came the program for creating this aircraft, Project Oxcart. The work was a secret behind the seven seals. The A-12 was created within the framework of the so-called SAP, Special Access Programs, or Black Projects with the highest level of secrecy. Among them, for example, was the Manhattan Nuclear Project, and later, the F-117 and B-2 programs. The number of people involved was extremely limited, and funding was carried out from closed budget items through the CIA funds. When designing a Mach 3 aircraft, Lockheed turned their capabilities to the maximum. Supersonic aerodynamics is not a simple thing, and at Mach 3 it becomes even more severe. It was the adherence to these requirements that made the plane so unusual. The A-12 is a delta wing monoplane. The wing has a slight washout of the leading edges of the consoles, and is coupled with the engine nacelles and the fuselage with extensions up to the nose. This solution had quite a few tasks. It was supposed to increase the rigidity of the structure. This form was diverting the reflected radar signal, and as a bonus, the leading edge extensions increased stability and lift, without sacrificing speed characteristics. All around, it is good. In modern military aviation, this is a fairly common solution, which became popular with the advent of the fourth generation fighters. But it was the end of the 1950s. This fourth generation was still very far away. At the same time, the aircraft is rather big and very elongated, with a modest wingspan of about 17 meters, 55 feet, its length reaches 31 meters, 101 feet, approximately the same as that of the Boeing 737-200. The fight against radar signature was also carried out, although the aviators did not raise its priority over flight performance. The reduction of the radar cross-section was facilitated by both the minimalistic airframe and the absence of protruding parts, as well as the use of elements made of radio-absorbing materials, integrated into the airframe by sawtooth-shaped joints. Aerodynamic requirements and visibility reduction strongly influenced mechanization. The A-12 is in fact a tailless aircraft. The role of ailerons and elevators is performed by their hybrids, elevons four control surfaces on the trailing edge of the wing. The vertical tail consists of two small fins, mounted on the engine nacelles and tilted towards the fuselage. To maintain their effectiveness at this size, they were made all turning. There is no other mechanization. Such a shortage did not help the pilots. The Archangels, especially the early ones, suffered from a lack of stability and were generally not the easiest planes to fly and this is at their speed. Even the slightest diversion could take the plane several kilometers off course in seconds, while changes in the flight configuration influenced the temperature conditions, and this had to be closely monitored. Various automatics and advanced stabilizing systems were constantly being introduced on the airplanes, but it took quite a lot of time and effort. Landing gear the landing gear of the aircraft, in comparison with the U-2, is closer to the classics. Three legs with a steering wheel in the front, but not without nuances. They are immediately noticeable. The legs of the main support are equipped with bogies with three wheels in a row. It was a compromise between the need to maintain a 53.7 ton or 117,000 pounds machine and the need to keep everything compact. Upon retraction, the bogies were hidden in a niche inside the fuselage between the fuel tanks. This place remained cold enough so that the wheels would not melt. The wheels themselves included intricate aluminum mesh and rubber and were inflated with nitrogen. This allowed them to increase their resource, up to as many as 20 flights. Considering the temperature differences and takeoff and landing speeds of more than 170 knots, this was not bad. 
A braking parachute, ejected from a niche in the upper part of the fuselage near the tail, helped to reduce the speed during landing. Fuel The A-12 fuel system is a special topic. The aircraft engines burn fuel like hellish dragons, 15 to 20 tons per hour of flight, easily. Such an appetite had to be somehow combined with the requirement for a long flight range, which means that a very big amount of fuel was needed. The bonus problem was that the wing of the aircraft adapted for Mach 3 flights was very thin and did not hold enough capacity, so the main supply went into the fuselage. In fact, most of its space is tanks, like in a rocket. In total, they contain 31 tons or 68,300 pounds of kerosene. For example, the fuel reserve of the hefty Boeing 757 is about 34 tons, 75,700 pounds or 11,500 gallons. The feature of the tanks was their absence. Metal tanks greatly increase mass and reduce volume, and lightweight plastics would not withstand the temperature. Therefore, the tanks were in fact just separated sections of the fuselage without additional spacers. Wet wing design. The solution was optimal, but it had a drawback that became one of the amusing nuances of the A-12 and its relatives. The fact is that the elements of the airframe in a hot flight underwent thermal expansion, while on the ground, on the contrary, they were compressed. Such fluctuations led to the fact that on the ground, the plane was leaking. The solutions to this problem were too complex, and the engineers came to the conclusion that if it leaks, it leaks. I must say right away that by leaking, I don't mean that fuel was gushing out of the plane. It was just dripping, and if it dripped in acceptable quantities, it was considered the norm. With the fuel itself, of course, everything was not simple. The problem was in the required temperature range, from street cold to a hellish oven. Under such conditions, ordinary kerosene would begin to boil, evaporate, and would eventually ignite right in the tanks, followed by, as they say at SpaceX, rapid, unscheduled disassembly. The ancestor of the Archangel's fuel can be considered the JPTS developed for the U-2. To work in conditions of permanent hell, on the basis of JPTS was created the new JP-7 fuel with a huge amount of chemical additives. The task was completed, the fuel was stable enough for flight, and moreover, played the role of a heat exchanger for a powerful cooling system, without which the filling of the aircraft would have simply fried. But in one place, the stability was actually excessive. The JP-7 did not ignite in the afterburner chamber. They had to add a special spark. In its role, it was decided to use triethyl borane, or in short, TEB. It has a very high combustion temperature, which was enough to ignite the JP-7. Its use is noticeable externally. At the moment of entering afterburner mode, the nozzle spits out a distinctive green flame. The same solution can be found on the first stages of some launch vehicles, like Saturn V and Falcon 9. A side effect, triethyl borane is a highly flammable pyrophore, which is why the refueling of the A-12 is rather unusual. The JP-7 could drip from the plane onto the concrete without bothering anyone, while refueling the TEB was considered extremely dangerous, requiring serious precautions. At the same time, unlike the huge reserves of kerosene, the TEB tank was rather small, and this limited the number of afterburner starts, give or take to 15 times. The flight range of the A-12 was approximately 2,500 miles, or 4,600 kilometers, which of course is not bad, but still not enough for strategic reconnaissance. To increase the range, the aircraft received air refueling tools. Naturally here, the A-12 also could not be like all normal aircraft. The dry weight of the reconnaissance aircraft was about 27 tons, plus the fuel supply, about 31 tons, with the maximum takeoff weight of 53. Yes, the fully fueled and equipped aircraft was 5 tons overweight. Therefore, a special flight scheme was developed. The aircraft took off at maximum weight with incompletely filled tanks and began refueling almost immediately after that. The tanker was also unusual. The specialized KC-135Q had additional equipment and separate tanks. The fuel was different for the tanker and the refueled plane. At the same time, the refueling process was rather complicated, given that the minimum flight speed of the A-12 was close to the maximum flight speed of the KC-135, so one was in danger of stalling and the other of flutter. Oh the times, oh the planes. 
the heat. The A-12 was created for flights at Mach 3, and moreover, it was not supposed to be short-term jumps, but a many-hour-long cruising mode. This meant hours of flight, with an airplane surface temperature above 250 degrees Celsius, over 480 Fahrenheit, and sometimes even more. No kind of aluminum could withstand such a load. It was possible, of course, to use steel, but it was too heavy, and at least the flight range would be lost right away. The only solution was titanium, which is quite durable and lightweight. But then, a problem immediately arose. There was not a lot of titanium in the USA. Previously, it was used to a limited extent, only on the most critical structural elements, and the A-12 is 90% titanium, and when traditional suppliers found out the required volumes, they just threw up their hands. The alternative was to obtain titanium from the largest supplier in the world market. The problem was that it was the USSR. Yes, one of the funniest episodes in the world aviation industry, the plane created to spy on the Soviet Union was in fact made of Soviet titanium. But this is the CIA, shady schemes are their kind of work. They created a whole network of resellers through which these deliveries were carried out. The cherished metal is still supplied to the United States, but in slightly simpler ways. It was difficult to work with titanium, especially considering that rather complex structures had to be made from it. Lockheed had to redesign production and create new machines, and it took a long time. In the early stages, most of the parts were being discarded. In addition, there were many discoveries. For example, during temperature tests, large wing panels degraded and shrank, which in flight could lead to the destruction of the wing. The solution was surface corrugation and special fixing methods. Similar puzzles came from almost all parts of the plane. But the job was done. The A-12 gained the ability to fly with structure heating up to 260 degrees Celsius, 500 degrees Fahrenheit, with maximum allowed peaks up to 315 Celsius, 600 Fahrenheit. For the production workers it was hell, and the plane turned out, to put it mildly, not cheap. But the engineers completed their task. Engines all the tasks given to the designers by the new aircraft faded before the problem of the power plant. The fact is that the usual turbojet engine is no longer efficient enough at Mach 3, and the load is too great, it simply would not be able to handle long high-speed flights. It would be better to operate ramjet engines at this speed, in which some of the mechanisms are physically absent, and their functions are performed by a high-speed oncoming airflow. Everything would be fine, but this very flow is required, so at low or even more so zero speeds such an engine is absolutely useless. Early projects assumed the installation of both types at once for flights in different modes, but it turned out that the plane was carrying several engines at once, half of which would not work in one of the modes, and in our case this is an unacceptable luxury. It was necessary to do something hybrid, combining both options. And then, Pratt Whitney got involved. Initially, the J-58 engine was created for promising supersonic aircraft, but did not gain success. However, acquaintance with the project Gusto gave the inspiration back to the engineers, and they considered the possibility of accelerating it to Mach 3 to 3.2. The engine itself, of course, could not pull this off. Calculations showed that at a speed of more than Mach 3, the pressure and temperature were so monstrous that no materials would be able to withstand them. A couple of hours of such a flight and at least the turbine would be going to the junkyard. However, if we consider the J-58 as the basis for a more complex power plant, then it was no longer a bad option. Pratt Whitney seriously revised their brainchild and added, let's say, a number of technical solutions that made it much more interesting. It's time to get acquainted with the turbo ramjet engine. And so, the power plant of the A-12 is a very unusual complex. Hidden under the huge nacelles is a seriously revised turbojet engine, surrounded by the second bypass circuit that is not at all the same as on modern aircraft. There's a huge inlet spike in the front, and many external channels are scattered on the nacelle. Let's see what it all is and how it works. At the initial stage of the flight, when the plane just lifts off the ground and picks up speed, the engine works as usual, adjusting the thrust with the afterburner. Air flows through the inner circuit to the engine, and through the bypass circuit around the engine, cooling it down and mixing behind the nozzle. 
cooling was very important, especially near the afterburner. The temperature there exceeded 1900 degrees. Without blowing, even a complex structure with a ceramic coating built there would not withstand a long cruise mode. To obtain sufficient air from the outside, additional channels are opened, located both in the front and in the back. As the speed increases, the configuration changes. The amount of air entering the external circuit from the air intake grows, and the function of the bypass channels changes. Now they serve not to suck the air in, but on the contrary to throw it out, eliminate excess pressure in the circuits, and remove the boundary layer. Finally, the spike itself. It surprisingly is made of heat-resistant plastic with a sharp titanium tip, and can be moved around. The automatically controlled unit, with the increasing speed, shifts backwards. At a cruise of Mach 3.2, this displacement reaches 66 cm. This allows the plane to control the configuration of the supersonic shockwave at the inlet, reduce its speed and stabilize the pressure, so the airflow entering directly into the engine has optimal parameters in various flight modes. And even all these additions were not enough. At maximum speeds, the engine, especially the turbine, is still experiencing two heavy loads. Here, another set of bypass ducts plays its role, creating in a sense another circuit that removes part of the air from the compressor, bends around the turbine and injects it directly into the afterburner. In the end, we get a kind of hybrid of a turbojet and ramjet engine. At the initial stage of flight at low speeds and altitudes, the J58 acts like a classic turbojet engine. But the higher the flight speed gets, the greater role the ramjet elements begin to play. Already at a speed of Mach 2.2, the turbojet accounts for 73% of the thrust, and at Mach 3, this share drops to 17.6%. The A12 becomes almost a ramjet. Naturally, this whole parade of technology is computer controlled, although the pilot has the ability to manually adjust the key functions. The thrust of this monster was corresponding. The J58 gave out up to 145 to 150 kilonewtons. For example, the thrust of the General Electric F101 engine from the B1 bomber with afterburning is 137 kilonewtons. When the aircraft creators saw what the engine creators offered them, the question was closed. Lockheed got an order for the Archangels, Pratt Whitney got an order for the fiery hearts for them. Cockpit and Equipment The A-12 assumed the placement of one pilot, whose functionality in general was similar to that of the U-2 pilot. For some time, the aviators argued about the layout of the cockpit. It was proposed to place the pilot in the escape capsule, but this decision complicated the structure and made it heavier. So it was decided to make a conventional cockpit with an ejection seat, and have the pilot wear a pressure suit, which with minor adjustments was borrowed from NASA astronauts. Actually, after a while, almost the same suit came to the U-2. Circular modernization. The design of the canopy, without thinking twice, was taken from the canopies of high-speed rocket planes. A wedge-shaped canopy with a powerful binding and a group of thick quartz glass sections of a small area. This design limited the view, but on a reconnaissance plane it was not particularly critical. Besides, there were no other options. Outside temperatures exceeded 300 degrees Celsius, 600 Fahrenheit, and even with a powerful cooling system, the internal temperature reached 120 Celsius, 250 Fahrenheit. Touching the glass was strongly not recommended. With reconnaissance equipment, it was both easier and more difficult. The suppliers of this technology were already trained by the strict requirements of the Dragon Lady, but in the case of the Archangel, it was also necessary to deal with the temperature, like in a stove. Everything had to be seriously reworked, materials adapted, and the temperature control system implemented. But in the end, the job was done all the same. As with the U-2, much of the reconnaissance equipment was located in the Q-Bay, behind the cockpit. Plus the cameras and sensors were put into four compartments at the bottom of the fuselage, at the base of the leading edge extensions and some space in the nose. The A-12 had the ability to install several cameras, capable of photographing with a resolution that allows the identification of objects as small as 30 centimeters. This is an explanation why aerial reconnaissance was preferred to space reconnaissance. Back then the Corona satellites gave images that made it possible to distinguish objects about 12 meters in size. So, how do you like the device? 
And this is without modern design technologies and computers with crazy mathematical models. Skunkworks veterans laugh sometimes that they have created the most advanced and futuristic aircraft in the world using a good old slide rule. Personnel policy followed in the footsteps of the Dragon Lady. Experienced Air Force pilots left the service and were registered as civilian workers with salaries paid by the CIA. Given the working conditions, the requirements for them were close to those for astronauts, including age, height and weight. Recruitment into the Special Roadrunner Squadron began in 1960. Primary and backup pilots, 12 aircraft, 24 people. For the tests of the Archangels, a training site was also prepared. Like with the U-2, Groom Lake in the Sierra Nevada desert, base 51. Another secret plane, and once again a desert without prying eyes. The program was slightly behind schedule, mainly because of the engines. The J-58s were breathtaking, but took a long time to refine. This did not please the customer. Aerial reconnaissance at that time became very tough. The incident over Sverdlovsk with the downed U-2 became for the CIA not only a shocking surprise, but also the realization that now they had nothing to fly over the USSR. The Dragon Lady was not going there anymore. Pushing the work forward, Lockheed decided to begin testing a prototype with the J-75 engines. This engine was more modest than the 58s, but it had good performance and, most importantly, was available. It was installed in the F-106 Delta Dart, F-105 Thunder Chief, and in Skunk Works it was no stranger. The J-75 lifted the U-2C into the sky. The assembly of the first prototype was completed at the end of 1961. By the spring of 1962, the plane was ready, and Lockheed, true to their passion of unauthorized maiden flights, took the plane into the air on April 25th. It did not work out very well. Due to a failure of a number of systems, control was extremely difficult, and the prototype, having risen to a height of 6 meters, 20 feet, flew 3 kilometers or 2 miles and landed right in the desert. The flat surface and large area of Groom Lake did their job, but a lot of people got grey hair that day. After a sleepless night, on April 26, 1962, the already finished prototype made its first official flight. Not everything went perfect, but the A-12 behaved much better than the day before and spent 40 minutes in the sky. During the year, the first aircraft was joined by another four, one of which was a training version with two cockpits. Here they decided not to dive into innovation and used a layout similar to that of the U-2. The second cockpit was located behind the first and was raised to provide visibility. Outwardly it looked funny, the nickname Titanium Goose quickly stuck to the plane. The Goose was actively used to train pilots and once even managed to ride the boss. Kelly Johnson was seated in the cadet's seat and the plane accelerated to Mach 1.5. An interesting experience when the designer actually flies his brainchild and not just looks at it from the sidelines. The tests of this team were carried out quite successfully, although they were limited by the engines. The J-75 gave out the thrust of about 77 kilonewtons, half that of the J-58. The A-12 lacked thrust to weight ratio and could not go faster than Mach 2. The work was again spurred on by circumstances, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Not only did Soviet missiles suddenly appear practically at the American doors, but their air defenses shut down another U-2, this time also killing the pilot. It looked like the Archangel was missing the fight for which it was created. The finalized engines arrived at the end of 1962. The A-12 began to fly on the freshly made 58s and were eager to reach the mark of more than Mach 3. It turned out to be not an easy matter. Difficulties arose constantly with the new engines. The peak of these problems was the loss of one of the prototypes. The pilot successfully ejected, but the plane crashed in Utah. Here, the security service showed itself brightly. The military officially announced the crash of the F-105 Thunder Chief aircraft and under the pretext that there were nuclear weapons on board, immediately dispersed the locals. The wreckage was removed and the witnesses were forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement with a lump sum of $25,000. This is the cost for the taxpayers for the lack of neuralizers, like in Men in Black. The aircraft began to jump beyond Mach 3 from the summer of 1963, maintaining the speed for 10 to 15 minutes. 
At first glance modestly, but any other aircraft at that time, even if it could reach such a speed, it would be for a much shorter period. The issue of cruising at maximum speed was resolved by 1965, when the Archangels learned to maintain a speed of Mach 3.1 for more than one and a half hours, and short-term maximum speeds were already around Mach 3.23. The flight altitudes were corresponding. The A-12s easily flew at an altitude of 24 kilometers, 80,000 feet, with a ceiling of about 27, 90,000 feet. Its cruising speed could be considered Mach 3.1, which is approximately 1,800 knots or 3,300 kilometers per hour. The history of the A-12s records is rather murky. Given the secrecy of the aircraft, much of the data on it is either not published or is published so vaguely that it can be interpreted in any way. The CIA loves to brag that their plane was faster than the Air Force's SR-71. On the one hand, this is believable, given that the Blackbird, with almost the same thrust, was larger and heavier. On the other hand, the CIA can hardly be called a kind of agency with whom you can just take their word for it. By June of 1964, when the planes had flown about 2800 hours, the entire ordered batch had been completed. In total, by that time, 18 planes were assembled. 12 basic A-12s, one Titanium Goose, which by the way still had the J-75, two more carriers of the M-21 drones, plus three planes were modifications of the YF-12A interceptor for the Air Force. But the history of testing did not end there. Lockheed continued to fly the planes to the full. At the end of 1966, one of the aircraft flew with refueling 16,412 kilometers, 10,198 miles. It's like taking off in Nevada, flying to Japan, turning around and flying back. In six hours, taking into account the slowdowns for refueling. The first information that something high and fast was being created in the United States began to appear by 1964, and Lyndon Johnson, who came into the Oval Office, wanted to hold an official press release. The supersonic race was in full swing, and the news of a Mach 3 aircraft would have added points to his administration. And it was no longer possible to keep everything in deep secret. They couldn't endlessly blame everything on the poor aliens. But, of course, no one was going to talk about the fact that a Mach 3 CIA reconnaissance plane was flying over the desert. The main hero was the YF-12 Air Force Interceptor, which was being tested at the Edwards Air Base in California, as well as the SR-71 reconnaissance aircraft created on its base. A special emphasis was placed precisely on them. There was no mention of the A-12 and flights in the Groom Lake area, and if someone noticed it, they could always say it was the same YF-12. By mid-1964, the flight test program was completed, and CIA pilots began to sit in the cockpits of the Archangels. By this time, pressure from intelligence reached its limits, and they demanded that the planes begin to carry out missions. There were three priority observation areas. The first two, the USSR and Cuba, were very important, but the saturation of air defense systems there was so great that the scouts were in no hurry to get in there. The third priority zone was China, whose airspace was also quite tightly covered, but according to various estimates was still available to the Archangels. It was decided to test the A-12 there. The Kadena Air Base in Japan was chosen for the aircraft deployment, and preparations for receiving unusual guests had already begun there, but then everything stalled. The Pentagon and the Department of State prevented the CIA from expanding its operations. They considered China too dangerous as well. The intelligence took a risk sending the U-2s on missions, but that risk was acceptable. It was a very simple plane, and its falling into the hands of the enemy was not considered that much of a disaster. But if the breakthrough A-12 turns out to be in its place, it will be a problem. The peak of controversy around the A-12 was 1966, when talks began about wrapping up the work and disposing of the park. The reason for raising this topic was not only the incredibly complex and expensive technology, but also politics. The A-12s were CIA aircraft with their own department and operations. Meanwhile, practically the same job was done by the SR-71, which was under the jurisdiction of the US Air Force. This was not to the liking of Congress, which did not understand why the budget was paying for two overlapping programs. The salvation was Vietnam. That's really the whims of the Cold War. 
The confrontation that began there, which quickly turned into direct military action, forced the US to temporarily forget about disposal and deploy the A-12 group in Japan. In the spring of 1967, three aircraft arrived in Okinawa. The first flight over Vietnam lasted just over three and a half hours at Mach 3.1, at an altitude of 24.4 kilometers, or 80,000 feet. The main tasks of the A-12 were to search for the strongholds of the North Vietnamese forces, air defense positions, and to confirm the presence of intermediate-range ballistic missile launch systems. The latter were not found there, which is good. Some people in the military already had theories that Vietnam could turn into a second Cuba, and then it wouldn't be far from the nuclear buttons. The flights were carried out regularly, and during early missions, the aircraft did not meet resistance, neither interceptors nor air defense missiles, which led to the conclusion that they were very difficult to notice, which means that all these dances with stealth were not in vain. However, they were not happy for long. After a while, the enemy learned how to see the scouts in the sky over Vietnam and began to shoot at the planes. But the SA-2 guideline, which became the main enemy of the U-2, against the A-12 flying several kilometers higher and four times faster, turned out to be ineffective. Despite all the epic fireworks in the sky, no planes were ever shut down. In 1968, the A-12 managed to fly over North Korea, and as it turned out, the country was too small for them. The planes passed its entire territory very quickly and had to turn around there, because next to it was the USSR. The problem was that at cruising speed, the turning radius of the A-12 was about 74 miles, and at this stage, the planes were constantly at risk of flying into the airspace of China. But again, the Chinese did not even try to shoot them down. As practice has shown, the main enemies of the A-12s were themselves. For the entire operation time, which was not so long, out of 13 aircraft, 5 were lost, but there was not a single combat loss among them. Actually, this was the end of the reconnaissance career of the A-12, and the decision on disposal of the park was taken into effect. This caused protests, primarily by Lockheed, but the decision was made. The plane, like a real rock star, left the stage at the height of its career. The Archangels went into storage, and the Oxcart program was officially wrapped a decade after its launch. The story of the founder of the family ended there, but the story of its heirs continued. Ahead of us are the three children of the Archangel, the YF-12 Interceptor, the M-21 Carrier, and of course, the Air Force Superstar, the SR-71 Blackbird. On this, we will take a break for now. Like and subscribe to the channel, so as not to miss the continuation of this Mach 3 marathon. Fast, very fast flights and soft landings to you.